Um, our second uh, session today will be iPad deployments using Mosul Manager and custom tools by Jesse Smiley and Jennifer Suzuki. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to them. Hello, Jen. Hello, Jesse. Hello. All right. Um, if you want to go ahead and share your slides, we'll go ahead and get started. OK, are you able to see them now? I am, and I'm going to go ahead and send them live. And you are. Got it. OK, so we are from Gateway School District, and this is our Gator IT iPad deployment presentation um, that we've been going ahead and changing how we deploy our devices a little bit. This presentation and any scripts mentioned will be available on GitHub by going ahead and scanning the QR code. A little bit about Gateway. We are located in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh. Uh, we have about 3,200 across our four elementary schools and our one middle school and one high school. We have about 600 staff, over half are issued laptops, MacBook Airs 2020 for all of our teachers and Mac OS 100% of them. iPad 7th gen or better for teachers who want them as well. And this is a little about us, Jess. Yeah, so I'm Jess Smiley. Um, I presented at Mac Evans before, oddly on kind of a similar subject. At the time we were using a different MDM uh, right before COVID. And so you're gonna see a little bit of more so how we've transitioned and what we're doing now. Uh, luckily for me, Jennifer started with our team about a year ago. Uh, Jen, tell us about yourself. I am basically just a sidekick as well as some Skyward. Um, so I started with Gateway in 2021. Um, I previously was um, an Apple employee. And so right now I do <laughs> iPad and Mac tech support as well as um, some of our Skyward child accounting. Um, I also work with what we've started our stu student summer help desk um, and kind of help more with the kids in some of our presentations on how we want them to use the iPads and take care of them. Technology deployed at a glance. We have four technicians and one director. Um, elementary school, we have about 1,260 iPads deployed. Um, at our Moss Side Middle School, which is grades five through eight, we have about 1,024 iPads deployed. Um, our high school uh, has about 1,200 Chromebooks, um, and we also have a cart of shared mode iPads uh, for some teachers who want to use those for different apps. District-wise, we have about 250 iPads and staff hands as well. All iPad hardware is enrolled in, all Apple hardware enrolled in Jamf Pro until April 2012, when we switched in January of 2020 to Mosul Manager, I'm sorry, to January of 2020. Uh, we switched to Mosul Manager in April of 2020 to current. And just kind of our growth as a district, summer of 2020, our fifth, sixth, and seventh grade were one-to-one -one iPads. Uh, we planned on fourth grade going ahead and um, going to fourth grade, but the pandemic kind of forced our hands. Um, our loaner iPads went out and one-to-one K through seven was in. Summer 2021, kids going from seventh grade to eighth grade kept their iPads, um, and so now grades K through eight are iPad. So our only kids who have Chromebooks are at our high school. Our iPad one-to-one K through eight life cycle. Kindergarten and first grade get our oldest hand-me-down iPads. They're coming from the students going into fifth grade and ninth grade. Our second grade gets new iPads. They'll keep them through fourth grade. 
our fifth grade gets new iPads and they will keep those through eighth grade. Um, our ninth graders um, trade in iPads. Our, our kids going into ninth grade would trade them in and they will get Chromebooks. Um, our iPads are on a five year rotation. After five years, they get retired. Our new iPads get four year protection from AGI repair protection plans. Reinforcing iPad care. So why iPad care presentations? One of the things we started doing for our kids getting new devices is an iPad care presentation. We noticed that a lot of our devices were getting damaged, um, some gross iPads covered in food, um, uncharged iPads being brought to class, kids forgetting them at home, screen protectors being torn out. Um, so we decided that we needed to kind of have a little conversation with our kids getting the new iPads in grades two and five to kind of reinforce how we want them to take care of them. Uh, for our second grade, uh, which we have been doing a present, we did a presentation for last year. Um, I met with all second grade classes. I visited them. Um, I did a PowerPoint presentation for them and had a little discussion kind of about their iPads. We went over some of our school iPad rules, um, things that we would like them to, you know, how we would like them to care for their iPads. Most importantly, other school districts probably agree with this. We want to keep stickers off of the iPads. Um, that's a major thing for us. Keep the screen protectors on. So we go through this when we uh, visit the classrooms and we discuss Apple Care and our expectations. These are some of the second grade incentives and the certificate I created for our teachers to use to get them on board with kids taking care of their iPads. Um, kids bringing their iPads to school and having them fully charged help the teachers too. So if we can get them on board, then we can go ahead and, and hopefully they can help us achieve what we're looking for. For our fifth graders, we have, um, we're looking at a little bit more of a grown up presentation in the sense of some different iPad rules, things that we've noticed. Um, while they do carry their iPad normally in their book bag, we want to make sure that we enforce that we shouldn't throw or step on that book bag with the iPad in it. Um, three ring binders are great, not great when you put your iPad in them. So these are some things that we decided that we would point out for those kids. Uh, we also are going to do a presentation on internet safety for those kids, kind of a few do's and don'ts, how to create passwords, um, just kind of making them aware of what's out there. That kind of takes us into our iPad care and internet safety um, Moodle's uh, training that is set up. It's going to be a refresher on the iPad care for the students in fifth grade. Um, it's going to introduce the internet safety, but we're also doing a quiz on both. Um, if the children pass that quiz, then they'll be able to set up a password on their device and change student email passwords. Um, the reason we're looking at this change is for our middle school students, we've noticed some issues with students um, learning other students' IDs and also with students taking other students' devices and looking things up on the internet that they shouldn't. So this has kind of led us to this. Barcodes are key for us. Um, barcodes are used for our asset tags and our student ID. Um, our, both our barcodes are used for inventory, check-in, check-out, two users and we'll show you a little bit more about our barcodes and why they're so important later. Uh, with barcodes we can easily scan hundreds of devices to assign to students at once. Deploying iPads with Mosul and liking it. We have four states of iPads in Mosul. We have our one-to-one -one student iPads, we have our one-to-one -one teacher and staff iPads. We have our shared mode iPads. And we have our limbo iPads. In Gateway School District, all one-to-one -one roads lead with limbo. After our hello screen, our iPad goes right into limbo. The apps deemed as most that must have for all students are tied to limbo. This way, those apps there are there from the beginning. Limbo iPads are only allowed manager and, set, and settings. This forces setup. 
So our login to manager and our iPad is now usable. Apps for all appear and additional apps by grade are installed. Our custom wallpaper tells you to log in and how to do that. The old way that we used to go ahead and do this was pretty time consuming. Once you go ahead and you get signed in, there's possibly a few gigs worth of apps, which the student would pretty much have to hang around and wait for us to go ahead and see that they finished downloading. This also caused issues when we were doing mass deployments um, where we had entire classes not able to go ahead and leave or students whose apps wouldn't finish downloading. Uh, so we kind of saw this as an issue and just worked really hard on getting this changed for us. So now we'll take a look at the new way, the limbo way. When our iPads now go into storage, um, they keep downloading the essential apps. So once we go ahead and we start to get this set up, they'll download those apps. They're ready to go. Any software updates that come out, our iPads get, and they're charged and ready to go for when we need them. and you'll see this go through the process. So all the apps that are apps that the students would need, you'll see are automatically going ahead and downloading themselves um, so that they're there in the background. So this is the process where normally somebody would be standing there the whole time while we would have to wait for these apps to download. This is all done um, before they're even here, before we know that they even necessarily need an iPad. This is all done in the background. When we hear a student needs an iPad, we then go ahead and do this process where we just need to sign them in. And you'll see now that they're signed in to Manager and into Mosul, the apps start to populate. And you'll actually see them pretty quickly pull through now. So those apps are there and they're ready to go because they were just hidden in the background. All the downloading of the apps took place prior to that student ever needing that iPad. Why do it this way? Well, it speeds up our iPad, our iPad deployment from hands, from my hands to their hands. Um, our Limbo iPads are inventoried on charge and automatically updated, always ready to be handed out in charging and storage carts until we're ready. We avoid any big Wi-Fi draws during handouts. Um, our posts log in by student, staff, they're ready to use. Apps are already there 
and we avoid things like bad certificates, bad time on an iPad, um, MDM server hiccups, play less of a role as they don't happen when the student and staff are standing right there waiting to pick up their device. Our iPad storage carts, um, we actually have four now, but we have our storage carts are divided by iPad model. Inside we have 15 on the top, 15 on the bottom. They're plugged in all the time, so they're fully charged and they're ready to go. Once we take them out of these carts, all we need to do is print a barcode for the back, scan into inventory, and then we're going to log into the Apple ID and Mosul Manager and send it to the building. When iPads go crack. Your dirt in, your dirt out is how we like to go ahead and, and handle our iPads here. Unless it's destroyed, you always get the same iPad back. Loaners are issued and these are shared mode older iPads to use in the meantime. Our iPad is then shipped to the high school here uh, where our tech department is out of in a padded case and then the iPad goes out to AGI repair. When the iPad comes back, it goes to the building in its original padded case. Students may be charged for repairs in situations where iPad, the iPad case has been modified, where any extreme damage has occurred. So I always stress the importance of keeping it in its case with a screen protector so it's covered under warranty. Jess? Okay, so how do we make this better? I like to see API magic, MDM device groups, a little bit of CLI scripting. We take these, combine them down, and all this is going to lead out to automation. Um, when we were a different MDM, we did a lot of automation. We got away from it. Uh, and to be honest, in the last probably two years, we're slowly going back that direction. So the big key to this course is knowing that we have a problem before our, our students do. Um, you know, we have API scripts that run and they're just constantly checking. Like if your iPad hasn't checked in in seven days, we're sending emails to parents, to the homeroom teachers. At 14 days, I'm making tickets automatically telling the, lo the local tech, most likely Jen and I, to go look into it, take care of it. <clears throat> we also use some, some grouping to deal with software update issues, uh, as well as student withdraws. A lot of things here. Here's what I'm doing with my groupings. Like right now, if you're uh, not running a certain version of OS, uh, I think right now it's like 15, four something, then you get the red screen, you must update, or you don't get Safari, you don't get Minecraft. Minecraft normally gets a lot of responses. Um, yellow is typically reserved for probably like two versions behind. We started doing this around Christmas, um, and, and, and the results are pretty positive. I send out through MDM now regular commands to update. Uh, but for the people who don't charge their devices at home, those don't always work out. This is our way of kind of reassuring that we're always up to date. Uh, other things we automate, uh, I have scripts that run for Apple TVs to set their names, set asset tags. Uh, again, recovery tickets. We also have scripts that put the iPad in the lost mode. It goes ahead and makes a ticket telling us we need to look into it, call homes, get our stuff back. Uh, confirming assignments, and we also have a script that retires Max on the monkey report side. Uh, again, I'm not trying to automate myself out of a job, but one to one's here. It really is just Jen and I. So, I mean, the only way to make more time is to, I guess, make the simple things simpler. So, that brings me back to our MDM. Uh, Mosul does not have a command line option. Uh, so I've slowly been in the process for the last year trying to write one. Uh, it's all ZHS, um, Z, yeah, ZSH, sorry. Uh, and basically I'm using Mosul's API 
along with some local caching of data to pretty much perform simple tasks. I will point out this does require API access, so you have to be a premium customer for that. <clears throat> uh, things that Mo's Basic can do, uh, loss mode activity based on asset tag. Uh, I can do a, a, a mass generation of a list of whose iPads are lost right now. I can send those sounds. Uh, we also use it for wiping, uh, for gathering info, assigning, listing groups, and doing serial checks. Uh, serial check basically being comparing a list of devices I'm probably going to retire, and are they still in Mosul? I mean, am I still paying for a license for something that I don't have anymore? So this is, come on. This is most basic, just doing something simple, like assigning devices. And when I was doing this, um, basically all I'm doing is I'm sw swiping those barcodes on the back of the iPad for the asset tag and the user's ID. Asset tag, user ID. And then it's just gonna go through my cache data, uh, look them all up and do the assignment. Um, normally, either we would have had to log into those devices manually um, or I would have to go through the web GUI and assign them. Typically, we like to see the iPads go into the kids' hands, set up, ready to go. Uh, so, you know, we're going to assign them. We're going to launch, uh, you know, iCloud, make sure it's logged in, and then we're going to hand it off. So, some other stuff we're into is CFG Util. Uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Apple Configurator 2, uh, but it also has a command line option. Uh, I'm going to tell you that after we get through a couple slides here, I'm going to attempt a live demo of this. So if there's something you do uh, in your office right before you do something, probably not a good idea, a little dance or something, go ahead and do it for me, please. So CFG Util, <clears throat> uh, it's installable through Apple Configurator 2. Um, that's where it's located. Typically, you have to have trust between the Mac and the iPad to make this work. Um, and I found a, a little way around that. We'll talk about it here in a slide or two. Uh, again, of course, it's scriptable. So talking about executing the script here, you know, your script. If you run a script executable this way, it's going to automatically give you some of these variables back. The really helpful stuff is ECID. That's how CFG Util knows which iPad we're playing with. For me, as a Mosul guy, UDID matches the dumps that I do, so I can look up a device that way. Build version and firmware version tell me what version of iOS is on that thing. So just kind of looking at this command real quick. This is not live, um, but we're getting there. So just kind of looking at like how this command works. You say list, and it's going to show a list of all the devices that are currently plugged in. Now I can go and I by the ECID, I can ask questions like the build version. Uh, this is iOS 15.5 build version. At the same time, I can ask about the firmware version, and that's going to actually just say 15.5. Um, again, trust is required for a lot of those steps. Well, actually, trust is not required for those steps. Uh, but to actually wipe and things like that, you need it. So what can we do with this? Uh, just straightforward, we're gonna take that ECID and we're gonna tell it to restore. Now, if we don't have trust, the restore will fail and you'll have to boot in the DFU mode. Uh, in my case, I also, after I wipe an iPad, I install a Wi-Fi profile. Earlier when Jen showed the video, the iPad going right onto Wi-Fi, the Apple Store Wi-Fi, uh, that's something that only exists here in our office, supporting our carts uh, before they leave us. And to make that work, I'm putting a profile on up front. And then I'm telling CFG Util to go ahead and call on DEP and let DEP finish that iPad. Uh, all the limbo stuff, all that, all that stuff that happened, like when you see screens transitioning, that's this command. So why not Tether? Uh, I actually talked about this side of CFG Util with Apple at one of their virtual things like in April. And they were like, well, why not Tether? 
from the get go, we were trying to do more than two or three iPads at a time. Uh, this process typically happens at the end of the year or you know, when there's transitions in the district. So I might have 10, 15 iPads here that need some sort of enforcement. Tethering wouldn't do it for us. So by putting the Wi-Fi profile on there, as soon as they hit the main screen, you see an app download, I can unplug, put it off to the side, plug in my next. Uh, if you're doing small batches, USB tethering is probably fine, two or three. But again, we're, we're normally bigger than that. So uh, the biggest pitfalls about doing this stuff, it still comes back to trust. Uh, my trust with my devices comes through Mosul. Uh, in our enrollment setup, I'm getting a trust profile through Mosul that I have set up on my computer. Uh, without that trust, that supervision ID, you can't pair, you can't do any of the really cool stuff like restoring, updating, and whatnot. Oh, and I made this mistake when I gave my Apple presentation. Apple Configurator must be open for that whole trust thing to work. <laughs> that was frustrating. Uh, so ways around the trust issue. I'm leveraging MDM to use the erase command. Uh, now you might think, well, why don't I do that every time? Uh, I really kind of, I like the idea of being able to plug in and see it happen. So we want to plug in for that reason. Uh, I also, the erase through the command line is faster you know, because you, you have to worry about the air, right? So if we can erase directly with a connection, it's it's going to happen quicker than the other. I do use the other, the MDM erase though, as my fallback plan uh, for when I don't have trust. Uh, again, you can boot the iPad and DFU, and at that point, trust does not matter. Of course, it's really tedious on the thumbs, depending on what cases you guys are using. So... Normally, if I was doing this in person, I ask Impress, you look around the room, but we're virtual. So all I get to do is stare at Jen and, you know, her head nods. So what I've done with all this stuff is I made something called Shake and Bake. Uh, this basically is combining most basics libraries with CG Util to automate the iPad cycle. Um, we're kind of automating the wiping, the updating, provisioning. We're working around trust issues by using MDM. I'm also going a step further and I'm clearing backlog MDM commands before we actually hand off the DEP. That's gonna help out with speed of deployment. Uh, if we have back commands, they're gonna have to process in some fashion or another before anything new is gonna happen. This way we clear them, they're not an issue. I also disable loss mode on the iPads. Um, most iPads that come to us during the year are in loss mode because a student withdrawed and it automatically went into loss mode based on our other scripts. Normally, I would have to then go find the device in Mosul and turn that off. This is all one-stop shopping. So this is the place where I'm gonna attempt the live demo. So hopefully uh, we'll see what happens here. Share, share something. Okay. All right, so this shake and bake is running in the background. I'm gonna use this camera, even though it's probably not the best way, because I wanna show you the iPads, the form that they're in now. So this iPad is just, you know, it's wiped, it's just sitting there. So I'm gonna plug it in. And you're gonna see here in a second that it's gonna come up it sees the iPad, it sees it right now by its uh, ECID. Uh, I prefer UDID, so it's gonna wait 30 seconds, see if the device figures itself out, and then we'll try to ask it again. While that's waiting, we're gonna go ahead and do another one. So this is actually a student's iPad that's been returned. It's got stuff on it, it's been set up. The hope is that we have trust. I'm going to guess being it's a six, we probably don't, but that's okay. So plugging in. Again, 24021 is the one we plugged in first. Uh, the iPad's running the latest, so we don't have to update it. It's just going to go ahead and jump right to the wiping. 
here's our next iPad coming in. Two, three, five, forty-five. Whoops. <laughs> Going back logs. Let's see. We had trust. So we appear to have trust. So we just went ahead and, and we sent that wipe command right off the bat. And I'm going to show you that both the, the, the first iPad we looked at is proceeding through these steps all on its own. I'm not touching anything. At least I don't normally have to touch anything. Um, it's got the Wi-Fi profile, so it's on. And now at this point, I can just unplug this. You're going to see over here on the left, it says iPad's completed. I can unplug this. I can just put it off to the side. I'm going to grab my next iPad, and I can just go ahead and plug it in. And again, it's, it's the same action pretty much just over and over again. Uh, and this will keep running until I forcefully quit this script. And so we've been using this now, well, I'd say probably since Christmas, straight on. We do not typically touch, well, touch much, <laughs> the iPads that come back to us. Let's see, so we're going to send this back. Jen, can you go ahead and put the presentation back up, shared, please? There you go. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, Jen, I think my clicker died. Can you click? Go ahead, try it again. There, you there go. we go. Okay, so what about us other MDM people? Uh, so again, Shake and Bake is built heavily on Mo's Basic um, for the cache data. Uh, there's also a lot of callings of functions from Mo's Basic within Shake and Bake. That being said, I mean, I did comment everything or at least try to comment it as heavily as possible so non Mosul people uh, can, you know, kind of go through my code, and if, if you understand your MDM's API a little bit, you should be able to adjust. Um, I have, as of this morning, put Shake and Bake in the extras folder in my, in my most basic repo. So if you go there, you'll see it. Like I said today it should be almost plug and play with with Mosul, but I'm sure these same things should work with anybody who has an API. Uh, just a warning about running CFG util in a loop. Some charging stations don't fully support this the right way. Uh, there's something weird that happens when an iPad becomes fully charged. Uh, as far as I know, I know that like lock and charge stuff works. Uh, the ThunderSync stuff's working. I have an OWC Thunderbolt dock here. It works great. Uh, of course, our other Intel Macs had lots of USB ports. They work great. I have a lot of Griffin storage docks, and I know they don't make them anymore, but definitely the black, the silver, they don't work for this function. Uh, and also multi-port adapters can be really finicky. As one of my Apple SEs used to tell me, mileage may vary, uh, and of course, we're probably also not doing the recommended thing, so for what it's worth. Uh, what about Automator? So for Catalina and Dow, Automator actions do exist, and as far as I can tell, they do work. Uh, but when you come to Big Sur and up, automator stuff does not work. You can't install a Wi-Fi profile, so you can't finish the device. That's where you get stopped. Uh, so we're going to say about applying all this to our loaner iPad pools. Today, we hand out loaner iPads. Like, you break your iPad, I'm going to give you a shared iPad. It's in shared mode. You log into it, and that's what you use until your broken stuff comes back. Uh, shared mode has a lot of little weird caveats that I, I don't necessarily know if it was made to be used as a daily driver iPad. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, so we wanted to figure out, like, how can we get away from the shared mode but still provide loaners? What we're doing now is we're using regular iPads as loaners. I've coupled the shake and bake script uh, with connect and, and sync charger, charge and sync chargers uh, that are available to Apple. And so basically you have a normal iPad 
I just put in a hideous red case so we can really see them from a mile away. Uh, you take the kid, you get them to log in, they set it up, all those apps come flying down, and, and away they go. Uh, when they come back, they plug back in the charger. We have another script that will take and effectively make sure that they're white. That script also makes sure there's tickets open and that all the I's are dotted as far as paperwork for why we're doing this. So this summer and future, Jen, you wanna pick up here? Sure. So this summer we had the launch of our Junior Gator IT Summer Help Camp, or some, our Summer Help Desk Camp. Um, so what it is, is it's a nine week program, mostly um, on Thursdays during the summer from 10 to two. Our students are helping us prepare returned iPads uh, for redeployment and for our buyback. Uh, students are learning about hardware safety, about how to deal with cracked screens. Um, our students are learning tier one response as far as procedures so that they can be the first response to their fellow students for our 22-23 school year. Um, our students are fed with help of donations this year from our technology partners in our local businesses. Um, here's some of those, um, our insurance vendor AGI repair um, is actually paying for our students who are helping in our help desk to go to mini golf. And for lunch, we have Mozo and Apple providing lunch. And then you can see some of our local Monroeville sponsors. Um, our local branches are providing um, a discount or free food for our help desk. Also for the 22-23 school year, our junior Gator IT helpers will respond to the tier one student issues. Um, in summer of 23, our year two of the, the help desk camp, our eighth graders will, will train our sixth and seventh graders and our ninth and 10th graders will train our eighth graders. For our 23-24, return our students will return actually to our gateway middle school um, we'll actually have a dedicated student help desk space there close to the main office we'll actually also introduce a new course for our junior gator it which will cover it ethics management presentations and of course it tier one support Our Gateway High School Student Help Desk started the 21-22 school year and it's overseen by Sean McMahon, our technology specialist. Um, it's very grassroots right now, but our students do some Chromebook repair in-house. We have monthly visits from AGI Repair, which is our insurance company. They come out and they show different training on how to do repairs on the Chromebooks and they give them exposure to many different career paths in IT. Um, some of our students who were doing well were offered the ability to possibly do a summer internship or job there this summer. Long term goal is for our junior help desk get students oriented with our iPad tier one support and it's their gateway to the program. When students then come up here to Gateway High School, they'll learn about Chromebook repair and they'll be able to assist with other day to day tasks. Um, starting for our 22-23 school year, we're going to partnership with AGI Parts to supply us repair parts for our Chromebooks, um, and then the students will continue to repair them, but we're actually strictly going to go through AGI since they've been so helpful with um, the training and exposure portion. Um, our help desk participation does qualify for Act 158 credits, which um, if you're in a school, those are really important coming up. They're part of the graduation requirement. Also, we'd like to give a shout out to Beaver Area School District, who also has a really great student-led help desk, and let us come visit. Some random small changes. So, we will be migrating to Mosul DNS for all of our district iPads. We were a securely customer, um, but this is the direction we're taking now. Uh, again, I talked about the new loaner model. We're going to be pushing that to all of our elementaries for sure right off the bat. I'm still working on selling my soul for magic beans. The uh, coming back with our gateway insurance plan for hardware. Up until this year, COVID funds have helped to offset the cost of these repairs. But going forward, we will have a student insurance plan for devices. <clears throat> and finally, we're going to put away put app management back into the teacher's hands. 
Of course. The sole thing. We'll see. So, app, well, app deployment's back in the teacher's hands. I'm looking to clear out my optional catalog this school year. Uh, when we came over from Jamf, we tried to keep everything the same. Just so keep all the apps there. They can just click them, install them on their own. Last year, we started talking to the teachers about Mosul Manager and how you can use it to control your class, control your kids, and even push apps out. This year, pretty much any app that we're saying is not required, that it's on the teacher to make it available. So the screenshot here is kind of what my optional catalog looks like. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The problem with this setup is any kid goes into their iPad and they install 30, 40 apps that they shouldn't have. IT gets calls about, you know, kids wasting time on iPads and, and et cetera. At least in the future, I can go back and say, well, teacher X says they should have that. <clears throat> so teachers would use Mosul Manager to set up class apps, class study apps rather. Um, study apps it would mean that when they fire up the classroom app or the manager app rather and start a class, only these apps are available to the kids during that class session. A nice side effect of that is if a kid doesn't have those apps, it automatically installs them. Anything a teacher has listed as a study app also appears now as a suggested app and an optional install app in manager for the kids themselves. They can put on on their own. So they're still having that self installability, but they're only getting what their teachers say they should have. So that kind of rounds us up here. I, I know there's a lot of information. Um, if you go to the GitHub repo, you'll see that there, there's also some, some example scripts. There's some drawings kind of showing how that works. And so back to you guys. All right, well, thank you very much, Ben and Jen, for uh, that very informative presentation. And I must say your uh, iPad workflow with the shake and bake script is slick. It's awesome. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with Q&A. Uh, first question comes from Bruce and says, is your director a tech type, a manager type, or an educator type? Wow. Um... Myco, when it comes to technology, is probably borderline genius. Let's go with that. All right. Uh, I know uh, you had posted your link about the uh, iPad deployments on your GitHub, but would you mind sharing the QR code that we could put up on the screen for about 10, 15 seconds so everybody can scan that if they'd like? Jenk, you go to slide two. Also, Nate Felton put the link in the PSU Max Slack. So that helps. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and put this link up uh, for about 10 or 15 seconds so everybody can see it if they'd like to scan the QR code. And then while that's up, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question is, what do you like better about Mosul over Jamf? Hmm. Uh, well, if you caught my 2019 presentation, at the end, I started saying why I was looking to leave. Um, in a nutshell, bad documentation that they refused to fix. We were premium customers over there too, and it, it didn't matter. Um, I had called Freddie Padavan, who at the time was, to my knowledge, the, the sales rep for Mosul, and they didn't try forcing me on the product. It was, let me show you what we do, and what we do it really interested me, the thing where I can make teachers deploy their own apps. Um, that was a big deal to us. So being education, Apple Classroom was a big part of that. When I was Jamf, I had to reinstall my classes out of, in my database about every three months. But that was also in the presentation before. Um, but Apple Classroom just works over here. And, I, and now I can hand off to the teachers and say, hey, you choose the apps you want your kids to have. I would tell you the big driving force was the iPad. I, when we ran Mosul and Jamf side by side for six months, um, iPad hands down, there was no reason not to move. I was very skeptical about moving my Macs. I didn't want to lose my API um, 
I'll tell you, Jamf has superior API. Uh, and I like the command line stuff, but in the end, as Jen wasn't here yet, that was only going to impact me. Uh, the teachers don't know about any of that stuff. They don't care. Uh, so really, I mean, the iPad side, the, the thing with te empowering teachers to run their classes better, to deploy their own apps. Great, great thanks. So how do you get uh, power saving settings within iPad OS from preventing automatic updates from occurring while they are on a cart in storage? We've not had that problem. Our iPads, we restart our carts probably once a week just to force the iPads to start up again. Uh, we, I do know that, I think, what is it? As of like iPad OS 14, if an iPad sits long enough, it will shut itself off completely. So like I say, every week, two weeks, we go out there, we would just restart the power strips on the carts. They come right back up. Because they don't have passcodes, they also go right back onto Wi-Fi. Cool. Are you logging in as the student, faculty, or staff prior to deploying them? If you are, how are you doing that without their password? So I'm using Mo's Basic to assign the iPad to them. Through the API, once it's assigned, I really don't need to log in as them. All right. Does the Apple Store Wi-Fi SSID automatically connect and set up Assistant without a Wi-Fi configuration profile from Apple Configurator 2? Sadly, not in years. Um, I know. Believe me, I, I really miss that. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a comment that says from Philip. Phil W, uh, he says, thanks so much for these tools. I'm sure to find them useful. We use Mozilla Business with views. Are you aware of any API variations that may affect Moz Basic? I am not. Um, as I said in one of our opening slides, I, I fully drink the Kool-Aid and if there was a cult, I'm there tomorrow. So if you do run it and you have some issues, uh, feel free to email me and I'll try to help you out. I, I'd be curious, really. And our final question, can we get a group rate on the magic beans? <laughs> uh, you know, between now and going, hopefully being in person next year, all of us, I'll have to work on that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that seems to wrap up our uh, Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and thank uh, Jesse Smiley and Jennifer Suzuki for presenting the second session today with Mosul.